Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church, whether you're here in person or at home. I'm Diana Cavins, and I'll be your liturgist for today. Will you all? No, nope, don't participate in this part because you don't have it in front of you. So I will do the first prayer, and then I will have you join me with the Lord's Prayer. Eternal God, companion of all who seek you, and seeker of all who turn away from you, draw near to us that we may draw near to you, and grant us the grace to love and to serve you, that we may find in your will our true freedom. Through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And now, will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So glad to see you all here this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, just another little technical note, Tom. I do think there are people waiting to get in Zoom to be admitted. Okay, but they might be in the Zoom. But I guess that it doesn't matter if we can't get YouTube to work. That's fine. Well, it's not fine. But it is what it is. In this final week of a four series sermon, Sarah, are you having trouble hearing? In this final week, I'm not sure I can do that for 20 minutes. Can we get the volume up maybe? I've never done this before. Test, 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 test. Yeah, Wayne, I think Wayne will get it. And um, it's the one that says pulpit and maybe the main volume, the red or the white. Hello, good morning, good morning. Is that as far up as it, there you go, that's, is that better, Sarah? Thank you. Thanks for letting me know that you were having trouble hearing. I appreciate that. It's helpful to know. In this final week of our worship series, which I've called A Wonderful Life, uh, we were been looking with an attitude of gratitude, I'm sure you've heard that phrase before, at the way that our practices of dealing with money can be transformed. If you've been able to join us uh, for the first three weeks, you know that we have brought the subject of money out of the shadows and into the light so that we can look at it, and in so doing, We've opened ourselves to a greater sense of community, just as the early Christians did when they worked together to support one another. Our scriptures help us to affirm that the more we cultivate relationships in our lives, the more we increase our chances that in every moment we will be loved and supported and will have the opportunity to return the same hospitality to others. And this investment of ourselves in a beloved community, in the beloved community, increases our constant and enduring hope and gratitude. Now, I'm getting to the scripture for just a minute, but I want to preface the scripture reading this morning with a few words about relationship and that word relationship. Because the kind of relationship that today's scripture, that the Bible teaches us this morning, does not mean friendliness. 
You can be friendly to anybody. You can be friendly to people you don't have a relationship with. The bank teller, the plumber, the hairdresser, somebody you pass by in the grocery store, Walmart or, or Snooks or where, wherever you go. Those are all occasions and you are called to be friendly. But the goal of the church is not to be just friendly. It's not, it's nice to have a friendly church and we have a friendly church here. And you should be friendly and you should be kind as the signs on the door told us today. Please be kind. You should be friendly and kind in your church. But if you stop at friendly, if that's your goal and you meet it and that's as far as you go, you haven't entered into the beloved community of the church. You haven't lived the wonderfully life the abundant life that Jesus promises, the life of Christ's beloved community is so much more than friendly. So I say that because I want you to listen to the words of the Bible, to the word of God this morning, and listen to for the relationships that the early church had with each other. Listen for the relationship they had with each other and also listen for the relationship they had with their money the gratitude that spilled out from them. Hear how the church lived in its early earliest years in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, right when the church began. Hear this word of God. The community of believers was one in heart and mind. And none of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Friends, may we be blessed in hearing and understanding God's holy word. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, you have more truth and more light ready to break forth from your word this morning. And we long to receive it and to understand it. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now we've been on this four-week journey to consider the wonderful life that we can have when we live in right relationship with our money. And I realize that being in the sanctuary this morning, maybe you haven't been able to clue in to the previous three weeks. And also because our consistory has taken kind of a lightweight approach to the annual pledge emphasis this year due to the coronavirus, I have taken the opportunity to not to ask for pledges, but to go bigger, to go farther, to go deeper, to inspire you to consider the bigger picture of how money plays its role in your life. And I've tried to do that in a fun little way by considering the characters of the movie It's a Wonderful Life. The movie where, you know, Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey, the head of a building and loan who suffers in the Great Depression and other reasons, and things get so bad, you know how the movie goes, right? That Things get so bad that George Bailey, you find him at the beginning of the movie on Christmas Eve, standing on the side of a bridge, ready to throw himself into the icy waters to his death, when an angel appears and gives him the opportunity, a wonderful opportunity, to see how the town of Bedford Falls would have fared had George Bailey never been born. The first week of our series, we spent looking back. Looking back and thinking about the kind of energy that each one of us have 
the energy and the spirit we have about money. It's a, it's a tough topic, and we all have energy around it. And we use the characters of the movie to consider some energies about money, like the George Bailey kind of energy where you're always sacrificing, you're a martyr, you're long-suffering, you're giving up. George Bailey gave up his dreams of college and travel in order to stay home and help his father, and then when his father died, to take over the building and loan and send his brother off to college and send his brother off to become a hero in the war while George, the martyr, stayed home. He even gave up his honeymoon night to save the bank, if you remember that scene. The problem with the martyr is, as the years go by, though, that George in the movie grows darker, he grows more resentful, until the money system completely fails him, and as, he, as I said, he finds himself on a bridge ready to throw himself over the edge. The martyr. Then there's Uncle Billy. I don't know if you remember Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy's the one that lost the $5,000 that put the building and loan in such crisis. Uncle Billy's energy about money is kind of innocent and happy-go-lucky and And his approach to money is to stick his head in the sand and and wait for someone else to take care of the problems, wait for someone else to make him feel safe and secure, throw his problems onto other people, happy and funny and smiling on the surface, but just underneath, full of anxiety and worry about life, about finances. George and Uncle Billy, but we also remember the other big character in the movie, Mr. Potter, and his energy around money, like a tyrant. Potter is on the board of the building loan. He owns the other bank in town. He wants to close the building and loan down. Mr. Potter uses his wealth to control other people, to control events and control circumstances. But the thing is, you don't have to be wealthy to be a tyrant to have that kind of energy about money. This kind of energy thrives on controlling others, manipulating others. That's what makes a tyrant. Mr. Potter cares nothing about others in the town of Bedford Falls, just himself, just his power to coerce and to manipulate the circumstances and bend them toward his own will. Then there's Ma Bailey, George's mother, who has the energy of of a victim. The victim believes that their money problems are always somebody else's fault. Now, this is a tricky one because sometimes that is true. Sometimes it is somebody else's fault, but even then, do we have a part in it that we don't want to admit? The energy of Ma Bailey is to find someone else to blame. And on and on and on down the list. Sam Wainwright, the druggist, the Bailey kids, even the angel Clarence all have their own energy about money that's portrayed in that movie, all in their own way to bring a certain kind of energy to the idea of money and how it plays a role in our lives. And so that's what we did the first week was to look at those characters and see which ones of those played a part in our own lives. The second week we spent looking in. We looked in on the courageous and emboldened vision of ourselves and the world that Christ has placed in our heart. And we pondered the idea that we have an incarnational faith. Of course, the original incarnation was Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. In some special way, beyond our understanding, somehow God was actually God was actually fully present, fully alive, fully there in the life of the fully embodied human being, Jesus, the son of Joseph the carpenter, and Mary, the mother of God, as she came to be called. That was the original incarnation. (laughs) Carnation, no. The original incarnation. But that incarnation extends down to us today, the body of Christ. We are the present incarnation of the eternal reality of Christ. As I said before, as imperfect as we are, Christ has no hands or feet in the world except us. You are the incarnation. You have an impact. 
to build the world that Jesus preached. And I think the broader understanding and looking in and finding that incarnation within yourself and your own incarnational felt, uh, faith can help bring understanding to everything you do, including how you spend your personal resources, time, talent, and treasure. We looked in to see if our spending of those resources aligned with the vision that Christ placed within us. We asked ourselves, are we spending ourselves for the kingdom of God? And then last week, after looking back and looking in, we looked out. We were looking out. Looking out into the wonderful life that Jesus is preparing. We, we considered whether we had sold out to the powerful forces of oppression and injustice or whether we were living as the countercultural movement that the early Christian church was and that Christ calls us to live. We spent time with Lydia and Prisca and Phoebe, those benefactors of Paul who supported his ministry, those all women of wealth who freely and generously gave to support the gospel and the spread of the gospel beyond Jerusalem and Judea. We noted that Paul's ministry prospered with their generosity, but also that they were blessed even more by their financial participation in what God was doing in Jesus, through Jesus Christ and through the early church. We were looking out to ask ourselves, who, are we, who should we be looking out for? Today we end our series on the wonderful life by looking with gratitude. I've always been challenged by the scripture that I read to you this morning. I hope when you heard it, it challenged you as well. It definitely challenges me. Consider the full force of what the early Christians did. None of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. As if that wasn't specific enough, the Luke, the author of Acts, goes on to get real specific. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles, and then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Are they serious? There are a few Christians who live this way today, but I dare say very few of us would choose to sell everything we have and turn it over to the discretion of the church leaders. Back when I was pastor of First Presbyterian in Owensboro, we started a young adult Sunday school class, and there was a young couple in that church that Kathy and I had become close to because their kids were about our our kids' age and uh, and they joined the class and Mike was a good friend and we shared and Beth too and we shared many evenings in their home and they and ours play dates for our kids mainly birthday parties and and but Mike and I Mike and I another Michael could not have been farther apart on opinions about the world. Just one example, and this is only one example, but Mike's job at a nearby aluminum smelter in Kentucky, his, his official title was Director of Human Resources for that, uh, for that uh, uh, smelter. But unofficially, he had been sent there by the company to suppress union organizing in the plant. In other words, he was a union buster. Now my screen went crazy. I want to tell you a story about Mike. Went back to the first of my sermon. So that's just to give you an example of who Mike was. Now we began this Sunday school class, and the first thing we looked at was the book of Acts. Early on, maybe the second or third week, we came to this passage that I just read to you twice now. And Mike, bless his heart, in the middle of 
of after we had read that passage and I asked people, you know, what's your initial reactions? He blurted out, these people were communists. But the thing is, he had gotten the point. At least I think. I mean, technically the early Christians weren't communists because that did not exist until 1900 years later. But it does seem that they had formed some sort of commune, some sort of communal life where no one person possessed anything. It's a challenging passage. And if we skip over it, we miss the witness of the early Christian church. Of course, context is everything. Because we also have to keep in mind that the early Christians truly believed, Paul was one of them, truly believed that Jesus was coming back very soon in their lifetimes. And so when you read Paul, when he says, some of us will not sleep, before Jesus comes. In other words, some of us won't even see our graves. Jesus will be back in our lifetimes. We have to realize that he believed, along with others, they would not, that before they died, Jesus would return in the way they understood that Jesus would come back. No wonder they sold everything they had. They, they had no need of those possessions in that temporary time frame in which they saw themselves. Now, the truth is that belief did not bear out, not in the way they understood it. And maybe they misunderstood what it meant when Jesus said he would come back. And maybe their financial practices of selling everything they owned and giving it to the church to distribute to the poor, maybe those practices would have eventually caused them financial hardship in the future without a long-term view down the road when Jesus didn't come back as they expected. And I think that's why most Christians don't follow this model of communal life, even though we still retain it in our scriptures, in our holy scriptures. And maybe those early Christians were short-sighted. But rather than dismiss their perspective, maybe we can learn something from it. Maybe we can acknowledge the kind of faith they had that invites such a radical life of gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude for continued, renewed human life, for abundant life, for wonderful life. Maybe we could acknowledge that this depth of gratitude inspires the kind of life where no one is left out in the cold, where no one is left alone, where no one fears for their well-being and the well-being of their loved ones. That is could be the true richness of the wonderful life that they lived together, a witness to us now nearly 2,000 years later. We wonder. We look upon those early Jesus followers with awe and wonder at the depth of relationship, at the depth of companionship, and the true radical hospitality they had in every aspect of their lives. Those who had it all, and those who didn't have two pennies to rub together, living in equitable community together. Maybe we could be inspired by that, by their vision of relationship. The more we cultivate that kind of beloved community and those kinds of holy relationships, the more we increase our chances that that community and those relationships will be there for us when we need it, and that we will have the chance to be there for others when they need it. Speaking of gratitude, just as I close my message, 
First of all, I want to say a special word to those of you, I'm not going to name you, but you know who you are, who made an extra special effort to make this morning happen. It took a lot of work, and you deserve the praise for making it happen. I appreciate it, and we all appreciate it. And I also want to take a personal moment to express my own gratitude for this church. You know, this has been a trying year for all of us, every single one of us. Some more than others, but all of us have learned new things, experienced things that were uncomfortable and we didn't like and still don't. Even before the pandemic hit, back in January and February, this church was dealing with crises that took time from the, especially the officers of your church. And even before they could take a breath, the virus came. And a lot of you know, in my personal life, Kathy at that time began to experience what we learned were some very serious health issues. So it's been a hell of a year so far. I think you would agree. But I'm not here to complain. I'm here to express my gratitude to, to you this church. Through it all, each, in your own special way, so many have reached out to me, have reached out to Kathy and our family with your support and prayers, and sometimes even tangible expressions of your love. Just this morning, I got another bag of tomatoes, an expression of love. You have been so much more than friendly to us during this time. Thank you. And with that, I want to encourage you to take on this one last spiritual practice as we end this series on our money habits, and that is to cultivate gratitude in your own daily life. Something I started a few years ago and continue with fits and starts now. I won't say I'm perfect at it or do it all the time. But I have, uh, at my bedside table, a gratitude journal. And on nights when I remember, before I go to bed, I enter into that journal at least three occurrences of that day that I'm grateful for. And I'd like to ask you now, we've got about six weeks to Thanksgiving, a time of when we emphasize gratitude, that you take the next six weeks and take a moment. Could be before you go to bed, could be when you first rise in the morning, but look back over your day and consider and maybe even write them down and then offer them to God. Three things or more, but at least three things that you're grateful for could be people, could be situations or circumstances, could be life itself, the opportunity to breathe. Take a moment and write those things down that you're grateful for today. And remember, our gratitude arises first from the love of God who loved us first. And since God loved us this much, we must love each other. No one has ever seen God, First John says, but if we love each other, we see God. God lives in us, and his love is truly in our hearts. So love each other and be grateful always. Amen. We have a lengthy prayer list that we use. Uh, those prayer lists, those prayer concerns are coming from uh, our, our three Bible study groups. Uh, they're coming from phone calls, emails, and texts that come in the office or come to me or to Betsy either way. I want you to hold these folks in your prayers this morning. Uh, LaDonna's friend Bethany, who passed away yesterday, who we've been praying for. Bob and Nancy and the people at Back Bay Mission. Bob, the Cases Foster Care Process, our country's leaders, 
peace on earth, goodwill to all. Ron, who is Andy Sr.'s friend, not not our Ron, another one. Uh, Susan, those affected by hurricanes, those affected by wildfires. Bill, a friend of the Schneiders, and Judy, also a friend of the Schneiders. Prayers for our church as we reopen. For Don, who is Max's grandfather. For healing for those with COVID-19. For hospitals reaching full capacity. Prayers for our mental health. Prayers for those who have been tested and awaiting results. For a safe delivery for Sarah and safe travel for the Mosiers. A prayer for calm during the election season. For Bonnie and Stephen. For Craig's father. For the elderly and at-risk populations in Vandenberg, Warwick, and Gibson. Especially for the Good Samaritan home. For Lisa. And a prayer for Nancy. I would encourage you to keep those prayers in your heart as we pray and lift up our prayers this morning. And let's begin our prayers with a brief meditation. Let us pray. Creating God for the awesome wonders of your creation, for the abundant feast of family and friends around us, for the plentiful riches of your presence among us, we always give you thanks for your love and your compassion and your concern. Loving God for those times that feel full of heartbreak when there's too much stress and too little assurance and a plethora of pain and not enough hope and possibility, we ask that you would be with us. Gracious God, for those times when our contributions and our, uh, our efforts bring more negativity than positivity and more resentment than forgiveness and more breaking down than lifting up, forgive us. And in this time, we open up the books of our hearts and we make an accounting before you of those times when we have failed, already knowing that you have balanced the ledgers, that you hold nothing against us, that you forgive all debts as we forgive, We are so deeply grateful and we commit ourselves this morning to create more good in the world. You are a generous giving God and we look with gratitude upon everything in our lives as a gift from you. We offer all we can back to you in service to your beloved creation with fervent prayers for a just world for all. With great thanksgiving, we commit to this spiritual journey of stewarding the resources and treasures that come into our care. Keep us ever mindful of the times when others have shared with us and the difference it made in our lives. So that our own giving connects us as a human family in ever stronger ways. In the name of the one who gave it all, even his very life, for love and justice, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray, and in the power of your Spirit, in whom we place our hopes. And all of God's people said, Amen.
one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But the one who sows generously will also reap generously. Now today's offering will be received in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary as you leave. And now let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Diana, for being our first liturgist back in the sanctuary in like seven months. As we go from this place one final time, I offer the words of hospitality and blessing that George and Mary Bailey offered in the movie uh, to a family that was moving into their new home. Bread, that this house may never know hunger. Salt, that life may always have flavor. And wine, that joy and prosperity may reign forever. May you ever be grateful for the bread of life, for the cup of love, and may you always savor the flavor of a life well-seasoned with generosity. You've been reminded of these things here in this time together. Now go and do likewise in the world, for it is a wonderful life. Amen.